Thanks for joining us today for Kenneth's Growth Executive Best Practice Series webinar. We're going to be recording this event and we'll be hosting questions at the end of the WebEx. And with that, we'll turn it over to Javier Rojas. Good. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, we uh, wanted to set up uh, today's event uh, for a couple reasons. First, uh, to introduce, uh, let, me, let me tell you a little bit about Mike. Michael's been um, running marketing for one of our uh, top portfolio companies, Prolexic. Uh, and I think uh, he's done a good job, a great job, um, and certainly better than I've seen in almost any other company in terms of um, driving, um, using marketing uh, to drive revenue, um, and doing it by uh, by executing thought leadership. Uh, we've been talking about uh, uh, using thought leadership in our portfolio companies uh, in a category for a long time. Um, I think this is one of the best examples of doing it, and so that's why we wanted to showcase it um, and so uh, so others can benefit from it. Um, I, I think the Internet today allows you to go one step beyond thought leadership and really to own a concept. And I think what you'll see today is a strategy around marketing strategy, company strategy around owning a concept and then monetizing that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michael to, to talk about uh, how he did that. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Javier. So again, my name is Michael Donner. I'm the Senior VP, Chief Marketing Officer of Prolexic Technologies. Um, we um, are uh, headquartered in Hollywood, Florida, and uh, we are a cybersecurity firm, and we'll talk a little bit about ourselves. Uh, my background and the uh, workflow that I'm going to show you today, this tool to basically build a marketing program such as this, I've used in multiple different industries and companies, both billion-dollar um, uh, Fortune 100 companies to small startups that never did marketing before and started off uh, from scratch. And we'll walk through how we did that. Um, at Prolexic, um, you know, as with many other startups, uh, marketing was overlooked at the beginning. Um, it's very easy to ignore marketing. This is a famous ad, and it's actually one of my favorite, from McGraw-Hill. And uh, they used to use this uh, many years ago. And it says, you know, I don't know who you are. I don't know your company. I don't know your company's product. I don't know your company stands for. I don't know your company's customers. I don't know your company's record. I don't know your company's reputation. Now, what was it you were trying to sell me? And that's typically what um, most buyers are thinking and one of the things that, you know, marketing can help overcome. And with a strategic marketing program, you can actually build, and we've demonstrated this before time and time again, a long-term, sustainable, profitable growth for your company. And for Prolexic, after we put this program in place, within the first six months, we saw a 45% increase in sales. We saw a 47.7% increase in our pipeline opportunities. We saw a 6.6% .6 increase in web traffic and 989 leads. Um, and this was very important for us as a startup because we needed to build a pipeline that was not only sustainable, but one that we could foresee within the future so that we could then make proper investments in our infrastructure, knowing what kind of business we were forecasting, what kind of revenues were coming in the door. And without that visibility beforehand, it was very difficult to make uh, long-term strategic decisions, and marketing enabled us to build that blueprint. So let's put marketing to work for us. Um, to build a program like this, um, I try to break down into six steps, um, and we'll go through each step and, you know, how to build this program. Phase one starts off with hiring that marketing executive. It's really critical to make sure that when you're hiring that first marketing position, that it's someone that's not only strategic, but also tactical. So many companies make the mistake of bringing in somebody right out of school and putting them in that marketing department and then seeing right off the bat you're not going to achieve the results that you're going to need to be successful because they don't have the domain experience and knowledge to do it. Or you get somebody that's all about strategy, comes up with a great strategy, a great plan, but then has no idea really how to execute it. So you really want to take some time to find that right person that wears both that strategy hat and that tactical hat to really ensure that you're going to build this program from the ground up successfully. Then after you have that person, the first step is your strategy. you got to build that strategy, figuring out your key messages and value proposition. And we'll talk a little bit later in the slideshow about how to do that, as well as build your plan, your budget, and your timeline. 
The next step, phase three, is all about the marketing infrastructure. You know, you can do that through hiring um, some team members to working with freelancers and contractors, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And most importantly, putting in an infrastructure of marketing automation tools. And we'll explain what those are, um, some best practice tools that we use, and the budgets that you'll need to um, enable to build that kind of infrastructure. Once you have that in place, then the next and most important thing within marketing is always content. Without content, you really don't have uh, a program, and that entails collateral, branding, sales support tools, um, obviously your website, and then integration with um, uh, your CRM tool, which for us is salesforce.com, and we'll explain through that. Then we'll talk about how to go to stage five, which is after you have your content, how to build your demand generation campaigns. And then phase number six, launching your program to media and analysts. And throughout the entire process, we'll show you how we do this, is you're looking at outcomes, you're evaluating, you're measuring, and you're making changes constantly based on decision data that you get. So you'll see that every investment that you make in marketing can and should be measured. And there are tools now and technologies in place that make it very easy to do this so that you can then make informed decisions about what works and see immediately in real time what's not working. So many marketers will spend all of their budget on one event or one advertising program and then realize after the fact, six months later, oops, that actually didn't work. And what we're going to show you is how to build tracking and analysis and reporting so that you know instantly if something's not working and that you can retool it, relaunch it, and um, not lose any momentum. So the first step, as we talked about, is really building the strategy and your key messaging. You really want to start off with, you know, begin with an objective, an in-depth review and analysis of your business. You know, looking at the business plan, your targets and objectives. You know, what are the market challenging and dynamics going on? Who are the competition, both today and what it could look like tomorrow? Doing a SWOT analysis strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You're looking at the ideal customer profile, and many times that's not the profile of the customers that you currently have. You know, maybe it is, maybe it's not, but looking at that uh, strategically, looking at your product roadmap, and also looking at what are the roadblocks that your sales teams are encountering today. Um, your messaging should answer the following question. You know, what is it that you do that's better than anyone else? What do you do um, to make it better? Uh, what are the important problems you're solving? What should customers choose you over your competitors? Why do customers need your products and services now? And what is our promise? So how we do that at Prolexic is Prolexic does DDoS detection and mitigation better than anyone. But we make no excuses. We're not the cheap, um, low-cost provider in the marketplace. We're very expensive. In fact, you know, when we started off uh, doing marketing, we, we realized very quickly that most people didn't even know what DDoS was, our sector, yet alone what threat it could pose to their business. So we needed to build more brand awareness and pipeline predictability so that we could make intelligent decisions and investments in our future if we knew what our growth plan was going to be in our revenue. Um, we also had to find a way to get our word out there and raise the level of conversation. We had to create a sense of urgency, and we found our story and our pitch and our data. The first thing is we answer these three key questions, which you always want to you know, put down on paper, tack it up on the wall, and remember it every day when you're building new marketing campaigns is who you are, what you do, and the benefits we provide. And for us, we made it very simple. Who we are, we're the gold standard of DDoS mitigation. What do we do? On-demand cloud-based DDoS mitigation the benefits we provide, Prolexic is the end of the line for DDoS attacks. And we developed a tagline that was very simple, compelling, and descriptive. And I, I really stress that is so critical for companies is when you're starting out and you're starting your brand, your tagline needs to be very simple, but also descriptive. One shouldn't have to guess who you are or what you do. And our tagline is DDoS attacks end here. Very aggressive, very in your face, but also very simple and descriptive of what we do. We also need to come up with a, a theme, and we look to thought leadership as what would really differentiate us in the marketplace. 
you know, we heard a lot of buzz from competitors out there making, uh, you know, false and misleading claims. And we wanted to kind of step above that noise and build a program where we would be the brand authority within the industry. We would be the one, the thought leader that the media, the analyst, customers would all come to to find out really what's going on in the industry. And we did that through our data. Um, we had massive amounts of data from, you know, fighting cyber attacks, you know, of our customers on a global basis. And we realized very quickly that if we could package this data in different marketing formats and cleverly distribute this data out into the marketplace, that we could build a sustainable marketing program and voice in the market through our thought leadership. So we packaged it into things like quarterly attack reports and threat advisories and vulnerability reports. We did case studies and white papers. Uh, we built a downtime calculator and um, other different mediums. And now all of a sudden we had a story to tell. We started to package it and promote it and the media and analysts started paying attention. Um, we knocked down walls with them to the point where today they call us proactively every time something in the industry blinks about a cyber attack, they're calling us on speed dial. Um, DDoS became and we made it become a mainstream topic. We became the thought leader and started to build a um, voice that enabled people to keep coming back and back to our website. And that was really important because if you think about it today in technology, the way people make decisions is they do research. Um, and with um, the internet and so many different tools out there, it's very easy and very quick that you can find out a lot of information on a vendor and both good and both bad. And you also have a lot of noise and competitors out there, so you've got to figure out a way to stay on top. And for us, it's all about SEO and SEM, search engine marketing and search engine optimization. So that when you type into Google, Bing, Yahoo, or any search engine um, that you use, keywords, we wanted to make sure we're not only on number page number one, but we're visible with compelling thought leadership um, and consistent um, uh, additional content adding on every single uh, week and every single day, we're trying to add more and more content out there. So again, we're reinforcing the um, the search engines and the crawlers to constantly come to our site. So you'll see in our examples in a few minutes, no matter what we do, the call to action is always on our website. And underneath our website, you'll see we use salesforce.com as our platform, as our hub that we run all of our marketing automation tools from. And as a result of doing this, we can, and I'll show you how, we can easily calculate an ROI on everything that we do. Um, obviously, for confidentiality reasons, I had to cover up our real numbers, but I can tell you at any time from uh, any campaign that we're running, what's the total number of leads, how many active leads we have, how many pending opportunities, how many opportunities were lost that had a touch point from this marketing campaign, and how many opportunities we won that had a touch point from this campaign. I can tell you which campaigns are bringing in the highest quality leads that translate into um, quantifiable wins and, and results, as well as which campaigns are coming in from, um, you know, and creating opportunities. Um, within the first six months, um, you know, this program, uh, we invested in 434,000 um, dollars uh, within a six-month period. Um, and how did we do this initially? Um, you know, we invested in four key areas, um, and we'll go through all of these with you. Infrastructure and tools. We launched a new website. Outbound marketing, we had to drive the demand in. And third-party support, you know, is basically setting this up. Um, because we were behind the times, you know, when we started our marketing department, um, the company hadn't done marketing previously, and our competitors were already out there, you know, top ranked on Google and other search engines. Um, so we had to develop everything from scratch, and we did that and scaled it by using freelancers and contractors a very cost-effective and efficient way to kind of build that program very quickly. So how did we build this infrastructure? We talked about tools, and these are really important, and we'll go through each tool, which ones we picked 
um, and address any questions that anybody has about these, obviously, at the uh, end of the presentation or afterwards. But uh, it's absolutely critical to build a content management system, a CRM system, a marketing automation tool, press and social media monitoring tools, and website tracking and analysis tools. And we picked uh, for our CMS system, WordPress. Um, a content management system allows you to kind of create, manage, store, and deploy your website easily without the need to hand code every page. It's a very um, easy, cost-effective, and quick tool that will enable you to post new content on your website on a regular basis, make updates and additions to your website, and um, any kind of changes that you need. Uh, for a CRM system, we chose Salesforce.com. Um, there's plenty of other options um, out there, um, but uh, we chose Salesforce.com, which made sense for, for Prolexic. And a CRM system helps you manage, analyze, and report your interactions with your customers, prospects, and leads. It lets you track from source by rep to identify where opportunities are in the pipeline. It lets you tie back leads to marketing to see which investments are working. And you can create all kinds of dashboards. All of these tools are off the shelf um, without any major customization uh, needed. And we also chose tools that are all integrated with one another. So we didn't have any very large expenses to integrate the tools or get them talking or functioning together. All of these tools are off the shelf. All of these tools are in the cloud. And all of these are also monthly subscriptions. Um, and uh, scalable by you know how big you fa uh, big uh, you are and how fast you're growing. Um, for marketing automation, we use a tool called Pardot, uh, which was just recently acquired by Exact Target. And marketing automation tools combine workflow and campaign automation with tracking and analysis. This enables you to do lead scoring as well as identify website visitors. One of the reports on the screen is a report that we get every morning at 7 a.m. It goes to all of our sales and executives within the company, and it tells me that within the last 24 hours, this person visited your website even before they registered, even before they started a dialogue with us. Um, it traces it back through the IP address, and I'll know that this company visited my website, they looked at 12 pages, they spent this much time on this page, they clicked through this, even before they registered. Um, and then once they register, it then ties back all the activity and seamlessly creates a record in Salesforce. And we'll show you how that works. Uh, but it's just an amazing, amazing tool, very, very cost effective as well. For press and social media, we chose initially a tool called Vocus. Uh, Vocus is a great tool that does social media monitoring and management. It's how we issue our press releases um, out to reporters. It also comes with a database of reporters that you can use to email out your press release besides just putting it out on a wire. It helps us build and manage our media contacts database. It also has a clipping service built into it so we can see what reporters are saying about us, our industry, and our competitors. All again um, in the cloud. Um, a very, very powerful, very robust tool. And for website tracking and analysis, we use Google Analytics and Wupra. So content and programs. It's very important early on to build uh, a very consistent corporate message, vision, identity, and brand image. Um, it's important to find an image that you can then replicate over a variety of different um, mediums so that when they're all on a table, somebody can easily identify this is prolexic. You know, from the color, from the graphic, you know, this is something unique and differentiated for us and helped us really identify and build out our brand. Um, you know, as we said before, content is king for marketing. You know, without content, there is, there is no call to action. There is no um, thought leadership. You know, taking all of our thought leadership and putting it into actionable marketing collateral you know, such as white papers, reports, and case studies. And case studies you can do even if you don't have a named client. We have successfully done case studies ghosted in multiple different industries. So many people kind of avoid case studies thinking, oh, well, we don't have any clients that will talk on the record. 
you can easily and very effectively do case studies ghosted um, um, because case studies are usually one of the best forms of collateral for decision making we find um, in technology. So let's put this all together. So now we've got some content. Um, we've got all different types of demand generation um, that we're trying to launch. And it's really important, especially um, startups make this mistake by investing their entire budget in one event. You know, they think they want to make a big splash in the industry. So we're going to put all of our marketing budget into this one trade show, go all out. And then trade show comes and goes, and, you know, they collected some leads, but they've got nothing to follow up with the leads. Um, or they've maximized out their budget that they have nothing else to do for the rest of the year. That's a big mistake. The one thing you want to do in demand generation, especially today, to stand out, is you have to have all guns firing simultaneously. You can't just do PR. You can't just do social media. You can't just do events. You've got to do a little bit of everything. You've got to do a little bit of everything simultaneously uh, because most of your target audience is going to need to see multiple impressions, multiple programs, multiple ads, multiple articles about you and your industry before they even pick up the phone to call you. So we're running all these demand generation programs to our target audience. Uh, when a lead comes in, in our industry, it's so competitive that if we don't respond to that lead within five minutes, one of our competitors is probably already on the phone with them. So we set up a 24 by 7 call center as part of our inside sales team to respond to every single type of lead that comes in instantly. So if you call one of our 800 numbers, it's picked up within two phone rings. Um, it's then qualified and entered into Salesforce all within five minutes. And then if it's an emergency request, meaning that you might be under a cyber attack, it is given then to through a call tree that we have to a live rep 24 by 7. Um, if it's non emergency, the person's collecting information, doing research on a potential project that might be coming up, it then goes to our inside sales team. I highly recommend an inside sales team um, for demand generation lead qualification. It is so much more cost effective than a field sales team. You don't want your field sales reps focused on cold calling, lead qualification. You want to maximize their time and efficiency with contracting, negotiating, and closing. So by putting in place a very inexpensive compared to field sales, inside sales team, they can do all the first and second level qualification, turn the lead over to the field sales, who then focus on just basically sure things to contract, negotiate, and close. And then we do win-loss reports after the fact. So for us, we worked and sat down with sales and developed qualifying questions. You know, if, you know, I said to our top sales team, what would be the ideal prospect that I could give you? What would be the criteria we'd have to have already mapped out? And we came up with a list, and then we worked backwards from that list, developing campaigns and programs and scripts for inside sales to follow to actually get to those qualifying questions as quickly as possible. And then once they have a, a prospect that is qualified, they do the three-way exchange, we call it. It's usually an executive briefing via a WebEx, a WebEx or a webinar where they bring them uh, the prospect, decision maker on the phone with the field sales rep or solutions architect, you know, um, technical sales engineers, um, and the inside sales rep who then transitions the prospect over to the technical sales team and field sales team who then take over the account. And that works really uh, well and efficient for us and has helped us really scale to the volume that we're at today. With every demand generation campaign we do, um, we follow these criteria. And we found that this really helps us focus as well as ensure that every campaign we do will be a success. First thing is obviously setting the goals, defining the value proposition, determining the messaging. You know, where's the audience? Are we buying a list? Are we renting a list? Is this an ad? Is this an email blast? Is this, you know, a calling campaign? You know, what's the call to action? What is going to inspire somebody 
to register for something. Nobody likes to register for anything, and everything that we do involves a registration. So it has to be compelling for the person to register, and it's, it's a philosophy that we call, um, from Seth Godin, permission-based marketing. You give me something, I give you something. You give me your contact details, and I'll reward you with content thought leadership that you can't get anywhere else. I'll reward you with very focused communications. I'm not going to spam you. I'm not going to send you nonsense. I'm going to give you value-added thought leadership in exchange for your contact details. And I'm starting to build the relationship of trust at that point. Then creative is just as important as the message. And you'll see that we constantly are changing creative you know, when we do our testing uh, on stuff that doesn't work. And we can retool within minutes of issuing a campaign based on the reporting of putting these tools together, and I'll show you an example. And then develop the follow-up campaign. It's fabulous. We've got all these leads, all these registrations, but now what do we do with them? So we always have follow-up campaigns in place for our demand generation and insight sales teams to follow up, nurture, incubate, and get that lead qualified and constantly accessing and measuring the success of the campaign, tweaking it during the process. So here's an example of a thought leadership campaign that we do um, every quarter at Prolexic. It's called a global attack report. It looks at all the cyber attacks that our customers faced all during the quarter, and we put it all together into stats and statistics. It's not a sales document. It's not marketing fluff. It's just straight facts. And what we did is just packaged it in different types of charts and analysis, looking at different industries, different geographies, times attack start, et cetera. So we launched the whole thing, and we do this all in-house. This is all done in-house. Uh, we do start off with a media advisory and press release. Uh, we issue all these under embargo. And what that means is you build a gentleman's agreement with the press, and any reputable press or social media blogger stand by these rules that if you give them something under embargo that's clearly marked embargo, they will honor the embargo, meaning we tell them we are going to issue this press release in three days. So we give them the embargo on Monday, telling them on Wednesday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern time, that press release is going to go out. That enables us to start a dialogue with the reporters all day Monday and all day Tuesday to do interviews with them, give them answer any of their questions, help them write their articles. You'd be surprised at how many reporters we work with that we write the articles uh, for them at legitimate, you know, tier one publications. You know, get them connected with references, get them background data, so that when that release hits the wire, you'll start to see 20, 30 articles appear. And this is what, um, you know, large companies to small companies do that really master media relations. We also do a customer alert and newsletters. You know, the worst thing is is to have your, your customer read about news about your company from an article or a blog site. That You always want them to hear about it from you. So we time our customer alerts simultaneously with the uh, press alerts. We also do Google, Yahoo, Bing, and LinkedIn ads, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. We'll talk about social media posts, uh, homepage banners. You know, we do inside sales, calling scripts, and email blasts. You know, they might be nurturing you know, hundreds of leads that came in from other campaigns, here's another great thought leadership campaign to put at them to start the dialogue, to get them talking and interacting with us so that we can start qualifying. Um, for each element, we do a custom URL for tracking because it's really important for me to know that Michael Donner responded to the tweet that we did on Twitter um, about this attack report versus clicked on the LinkedIn posting versus the press release posting versus came to our website versus came through a direct response or a news article. We typically do about 24 microsites per campaign, and with the tool Pardot, it's a simple mouse click to replicate a, mi a microsite. It is that simple. So it's very easy to build these microsites and this traffic uh, reporting so that you know exactly where leads are coming in, even down to you know Twitter tweets. Um, everything is integrated, Pardot and Salesforce for the tracking, and we also do additional tracking with Google Analytics, Woopra, and Vocus. So social media, you know, why to do social media? And you know, I was very hesitant um, 
to do social media at Prolexic Ice was like, oh, I don't think that's really going to work with this industry. We tested it, and I can tell you for a fact, I am still today getting deals that closed from initial contact through Twitter. You know, we'll issue a tweet. It's, you know, retweeted by our followers. We get a prospect that comes in through Twitter. It's qualified. We take it through the whole sales process and close the deal. So I can show you an ROI on simple tweets that are we, we are doing. Um, social media works if you do it right. You've really got to understand your medium. You've got to understand your voice within each, each medium. You know, your voice in Facebook is different than your voice in LinkedIn. It's different on Twitter. You've got to use YouTube and videos we found are very successful as well. They don't have to be, you know, um, Hollywood production status, um, you know, to get results and qualified leads. Um, you know, social media gives us branding. It gives us awareness. It gives us tremendous traffic to our website, which is fantastic for SEO, again, for the natural search and paid search. Um, it gives us tons of leads and opportunities, and it also enables us to do nurturing and personalized touch um, uh, that uh, you can't really do in any other kind of media. You know, search engine optimization. You know, SEO affects everything, including your pay-per-click advertising. You know, you need to spend a lot of time optimizing every single page, every single word on your website. You know, the content, the meta tags, the strategic use of HTML, HTML and descriptive URLs. You know, we've done all different types of backlink, backlinking to our website, which helps our, our uh, rankings, deep links in all of our press releases and all of our materials. And by doing this, it's brought down our cost for Google advertising because of relevancy, because the more relevant you are under the line, the, the higher number of times you'll show up above the line, as well as the lower cost per click. You know, Google AdWords, you know, we do a lot of testing with it. It's a very expensive medium. It's one you've got to monitor all the time and constantly shuffle your budgets around. You know, we run about 12 different campaigns simultaneously. Every campaign is done by region. Um, we also uh, have five different ad groups. We have unique landing pages for each ad so that we can measure it. We usually start off with four ads per group, and then we limit it down to the top two performing ones. You know, all of our campaigns are optimized for conversions, uh, which is basically click-through and registration. Um, we also found that, you know, uh, Google search is dominant in most parts of the world, but not all the parts of the world. We found in our business, Yahoo and Bing, specifically in Asia, is actually used more often uh, for B2B searches. Um, so we also advertise on Yahoo and Bing in strategic geographies. We also you know, leverage what we're doing in Google AdWords and just replicate that in Yahoo and Bing and found that we get higher quality leads and inquiries in Yahoo and Bing in certain geographies in Asia. Um, we also uh, advertise in social media mediums like LinkedIn. Um, it's very clever and creative. In LinkedIn, you can really pinpoint an audience based on a user profile. So right now, we're running an e-commerce campaign. It's, you know, um, uh, cyber season for um, e-retailers, the biggest time of the year for them. They can't afford to have their websites uh, attacked or go down. So we're running a program right now to uh, companies um, and individuals on LinkedIn who are over 500 um, person companies who have titles of director or VP and above on LinkedIn, and we can really narrow and pinpoint down and actually push out specific ads based on titles, based on industry, based on um, all different types of criteria. And uh, we're in our initial phase of that, um, that type of program, but so far seeing some positive results. Public relations is also instrumental to our SEO, SEM program. Everything we do is around PR. We never have used a PR agency. Um, we do all of this in-house using these tools that I've shown you, um, as well as um, a writer, you can build a program like this. We average three press releases a month. They're all thought leadership focused. They're all case studies, white papers, attack reports, threat advisories, no marketing fluff. It's all thought leadership. 
Um, we set up a press room on prolexic.com. We use um, Vocus, um, you know, for our media database and distribution of our press releases. And we also built a relationship and a rapport with reporters by being responsive. Reporters know that if they call Michael Donner, they're going to get called back in five minutes. They're going to get called back with, you know, content, thought leadership, and an executive to do their interview. They, you know, I know they work on deadlines. They know I can respect their deadlines, and that kind of rapport is instrumental. So many companies get arrogant and ignore media requests. You never ignore a media request. If you can't speak on the topic, you politely decline it and you try to make a referral. You try to help them. Is once you become that source of help, you've built a relationship that will pay dividends over and over again. Um, for us at Prolexic, you know, we've um, increased the number of press releases we've done by 112% uh, this year versus last year, and our Prolexic mentions have gone up over 188%. And when we put thought leadership out there like an attack report, Again, no PR agency, no PR consultant. We are typically getting between 90 to 100 feature articles per threat advisory. Um, and those are not one word mentions in an article is not a feature article. Um, these are articles that are written on Prolexic and our thought leadership. Um, and it happens time and time again. Um, and we get coverage, everything from the Wall Street Journal, to tier one publications of Computer World, to eWeek, to Forbes, um, and we get coverage globally. Um, I don't speak any other language besides English, unfortunately, but um, you do a search on Prolexic and you'll see articles written about us in every language, every geography, and I manage all of that through the Vocus um, automated PR system. And there's other tools out there besides Vocus, it's just the one that we use, and you can do this as well. Um, analyst relations, absolutely critical, especially for global 1,000 companies. They rely on the analyst for third-party endorsement and validation of technologies and solutions. You know, even if you don't have the budget, there, every single analyst firm is obligated to take a minimum of one briefing from you per, court, uh, per year, per company. Um, so it's really important to start that outreach with analysts. Make sure that you have something valuable to say. Show them that you're a thought leader and you're a visionary. Um, show them, you know, very clearly and succinctly through a presentation is usually the best way to do these analyst briefings. You know, what you are, who you are, your messages, your value proposition, and, um, you know, do this on a regular basis with the analyst. Because if you do that first impression right, you'll get much more than one free briefing a year without subscribing to the services. You know, you've got to build relationships with your prospects and nurturing. You know, once somebody registers for a campaign and is in your database, you've got to constantly think about how are we going to incubate and nurture this. That person might have just been doing research and isn't ready to buy, but you've got to stay in the forefront of them. So we spend a lot of time doing ongoing communications. We do a quarterly newsletter, an email newsletter. We do regular email blasts of our thought leadership every week with the new campaign coming out. So if we have a new case study in e-commerce and we're incubating a couple hundred e-commerce prospects already, we'll do a custom blast of the new thought leadership to that e-commerce list. This is all a simple mouse click in Parda and Salesforce. These are not hard to replicate. These are not hard to set up. These are not hard to design. Um, all of these tools are very user friendly. We don't know HTML, we're not programmers, we're not designers, but yet we can produce this stuff. Um, and um, just from learning from the self-taught tutorials that these companies give, that's how easy some of these tools are. So here's how it all works. You know, we have the campaign, so whether it's an ad, a newsletter, whatever it is, you know, it has a call to action. So the person clicks on the call to action or goes to the URL. They get to the microsite landing page. Again, built all in Pardot. Easy, you know, to replicate the, um, the uh, uh, landing pages. Uh, we usually do, like I said, 20 plus per campaign. So they're on the landing page. There's some premium content on there with the registration. The prospect then, you know, clicks on to download, fills out the, the quick form. Instantly, they get sent a thank you page that comes up on their screen. And within a minute, they get an email sent directly from Salesforce 
with a download direct link of the content that they asked for. While all this is happening within microseconds, that registration form has already populated into Salesforce and created a record. It's also then Salesforce automatically then assigns that, that lead to the inside sales or field rep whose territory where that lead is based. And that field rep is then notified via an alert from Salesforce that, hey, you got a new lead, here's all the information from them so that they can contact them right away. And then they're put into you know, the nurturing campaign depending on the situation. If the field rep or inside sales rep can't reach them right away, you know, we start incubating that lead you know, depending on uh, you know, the information that we have you know, through permission-based marketing. We then start to send them thought leadership that's very relevant to their industry, their focus, and their attention. And for every campaign, we've craft out a flowchart. Um, you know, we want to try to diagnose every scenario we can, thinking about, you know, from the lead, clicking on the registration, what's the process? You know, what are we going to send them? How are they going to respond? If they react and they talk to us right away, what do we say? If they don't talk to us right away, how do we nurture that relationship? So we build that. And we also train um, constantly our sales teams and inside sales teams on every campaign before it goes out the door, here's the campaign, here's what it's about, here's the premium content for it, you know, here's a script for inside sales to use, here's a follow-up email blast. We give all these tools to our sales teams before the campaign goes out the door because we don't want anybody caught off guard with, oh, you know, a prospect or a customer calls in and um, wants to you know, talk about this white paper and the field rep has no idea what the white paper is about. So you want to avoid that at all costs. So today, um, we use a variety of different tools. For social media, you can see we use uh, three tools, Social Bro, Twitalizer, and Clout. For our website, we use Google Analytics and Wipra. For um, Pardot, um, our marketing automation tool for conversion and tracking, we use Pardot. For our lead and opportunity tracking, we use Salesforce. For our media coverage and distribution, we use Vocus and Meltwater. And for SEO tracking and analysis, uh, we use Analytics SEO and Spifu. All of these are off the shelf. All of these are on the cloud. All of these are monthly subscriptions. And all of these are very affordable. And most important, all are integrated with each other. So you don't need any kind of programmer or systems integrator coming in to you know, build an infrastructure to tie all these together. There are they all already work together. And through this process, like I said, by having these tools, I can report constantly on uh, you know, how many opportunities we have from these touch points, how many deals have been won or lost that touch this touch point, how many are active, how many leads. Um, I can then also see which mediums are pulling in the leads from the campaign. It really gives me intelligence to make great decisions for Prolexic to really maximize our limited resources and our limited budget to compete effectively against billion dollar players in our industry. So here's a case study. This is a true story um, of you know, how this all worked. So this was a very, very famous uh, brand retailer. Um, and this retailer, um, the prospect, their chief security information officer it happened to be, did a uh, Google search on DDoS protection on Google. The prospect then saw our ad come up on the top three ads, as well as saw content on us in the natural search. The prospect clicked on the ad for the free DDoS attack white paper, attack report. The prospect went to the landing page, fill out the registration, and uh, downloaded the attack report and some case studies. Inside sales then started to contact, you know, um, it went through our whole process, but the prospect wasn't ready to talk at this point. They didn't, they, you know, ducked all the calls, didn't respond to our inside sales team calling them. So we started a nurturing campaign over the next weeks. Um, you know, it lasted for about a month with this one prospect every week, something new, another e-commerce case study, another e-commerce white paper, something relevant to them. One month later, the prospect returned to our website and filled out an emergency request form, meaning their site was probably under attack at that point. Um, the call center then received the alert at 2.40. The call center qualified the alert at 2.45. Uh, 
The information provided from the form uh, was already pre-populated. Long story short, the salesperson closed the deal within 24 hours. So again, building all these different phases, starting off with hiring the marketing executive, building the strategy, the infrastructure, the content, launching the campaigns, and measuring and tracking your results, you can achieve a program like this. I know that was a lot. Um, we have um, some uh, questions. Please feel free to submit your questions via chat. One uh, quick point I wanted to highlight as I moved before, um, on the strategy part, I think that's a critical part of this to make, um, uh, to make this uh, work. Uh, the whole second part is really about capturing um, the, uh, uh, the interest that, uh, and attention that that generates. Um, I think um, we have a number of portfolio companies on the line. I think each of you are addressing industries that are going through or uh, markets that are going through lots of changes. There's a lot to press. So I think the question is, what is the, um, what is the point of focus for the company that's critical? And then how does that relate to a pain point in the market? And I think another interesting point here is um, I think you all know how focused we are on data and leveraging data. What's interesting here is Selectic looked at its data and was able to use that to create a lot of uh, news and information uh, around the pain point in its market. So I think uh, the question I think for each of you, guys, each of you would be uh, what data do you have, what insights do you have that could be put together as news, informative, and get into the national dialogue on what's going on in your market. So, uh, Michael, let me uh, start with a question. So this all sounds great. Seems like a lot of work. All, all these companies are, are fairly capital efficient. Um, how, uh, how much money, uh, how, how big was the team and how much money was involved here, both from a a, a people cost and then from a, um, you know, from a technology and, you know, lead buying cost. Sure. So we started off, um, I was an individual contributor um, and uh, the company had never really done marketing before. Um, the head of sales at that time, uh, you know, did whatever he could at the point um, to try to do some marketing, uh, but obviously his main focus was sales. So uh, I came in as an individual contributor, you know, rolled up my sleeves, started to build the program, very uh, quickly started to bring in freelancers, contractors uh, by the hour to help build the momentum. Uh, we added the second team member about four months later, um, and it was just a team of me and the second team member uh, for those first six months, um, supplemented by um, hourly contractors, which were primarily writers, um, that helped us build the you know thought leadership, uh, you know white papers, as well as one contract freelance uh, graphic artist. Um, we then invested in the tools. Um, the tools uh, can cost anywhere from um, six thousand to twelve thousand per month uh, for all of them. Uh, depending, obviously, on how many users, how much functionality, and how in-depth you want to get. Um, you know, and we continue to scale with the tools. So we started out uh, with very few versions of some of these tools and then obviously had to add more users as, you know, sales took off, our sales force grew, and um, the success of the program. So you can start off, you know, as an individual. So first 12 months budget, what would you, what would you put for this if a, a CEO came to you and said, I want to replicate this? Um, we, for our first six months, it was about 430000 was our total cost. Mm -hmm. And um, it was under a million um, for our first full year after that. Right. Okay. Okay, great. Great. One additional comment, uh, the, uh, the stats on growth that uh, Michael showed were a bit conservative. Um, since you only get so much impact in the first six months, the uh, company's not growing over 100% a year, um, largely as a result of these initiatives.
Does anybody else have any other questions? Feel free to send questions via chat. We have a, a question. At what point do you recognize the strategy or tactic isn't working and change course? So, I mean, how much time do you really give for them to develop and bear fruit? Oh, great question. Um, we, I'll give you an example. We've been um, running as part of our Q4 campaign, our e-commerce campaign, we've been running in news, uh, newsletter banner ads. Um, I find that banner ads are much more effective. Uh, you know, each publication issues out like a weekly newsletter, you know, compilation of all different articles or a daily news flash, and you can buy a banner ad on it. So we bought banner ads. Um, within literally two hours of the publication sending it out, we can already see our click-through rate. Um, and what we found when we first started running the campaign in October, um, the first few ads, we weren't getting a lot of clicks. So we instantly changed it, um, you know, the, actually the first day that we ran the ad and we saw that we didn't get a lot of clicks, we changed the creative. We kept the same headline, changed the creative. Um, then we watched, you know, the next week to see if the new creative worked better. We got a couple more clicks. So we, we were constantly evolving. Every week we were changing creative, we were changing headline until we found the one that just got, uh, you know, the stampede of clicks and qualified. So for every campaign we do, um, we're constantly retooling. I don't think there's been one campaign you know, that we've ever done that we haven't done any retooling on. And that's the beauty of all these tools is even um, an email blast that you know, we do out to a database, you know, we can see within a matter of minutes of the email going out what the results are. Um, we do a lot of A-B testing as well, uh, which means that we'll send out two different mailers to two small lists and see which mailer, the headline, and which graphic works better, and then you know make a bigger decision on a larger distribution list. Um, so I, I just suggest constantly looking uh, and constantly trying to do better. You know, that's the fun thing in marketing is always trying to figure out you know your audience and what's going to resonate. And even if you everyone in your company thinks it's a brilliant idea, a great execution, you know it might not work with your audience, and you just got to be prepared you know, and quick on your feet to retool it and relaunch it. Um, there was a question about where uh, can we download this uh, presentation. Um, uh, Ken, it will make the presentation available after um, the conference through an email blast that we'll send out that will have a link that you can download um, the presentation from. Another question. Uh, what kinds of things should we look for when hiring into a position like this? Great question. Um, we've uh, been growing our department. Uh, you know, as I said, I started off as an individual contributor and then about four months later hired our first uh, team member. And today, uh, for the last several months, we were three people. Um, and I'm looking for the fourth person right now. And I've interviewed hundreds of people. And what I'm finding is that very few people understand marketing automation. And that is so critical, that if they don't understand marketing automation, it's going to take you too long to, to train them, educate them, and bring them up to speed. So one of the most important things I find in hiring people, especially you know, for um, roles that are starting up a department, is are they strategic? Can they roll up their sleeves? And most importantly, do they understand marketing automation? You know, do they know how to do ROI reporting? You know, you know, do they understand that every marketing investment needs to be measured? Um, do they have experience using Salesforce? Do they have it or, you know, any other kind of tool like that? Have they used Marketo or Pardot? Um, Act on. There's hundreds of marketing automation tools out there today. You know, they don't have to be an advanced user of it. They just really need to understand the concept and the philosophy because you really can't train your first and second hires on that. They have to come in and train the company on that. Another question. Um, uh, what can you tell us more about how refining the strategy, um, how were the holy cow oh, moments? Uh, what were the holy cow moments? Uh, um, it was a lot of fun. We actually, um, when I started, um, I actually did not come from um, the cybersecurity market. Um, I had worked in hardware and software industries and service industries before. 
but not cybersecurity. So the first thing that I did is um, went to the mailbox every day um, downstairs, and I just was looking at what mail people were getting from what trade shows and what um, publications they were reading. And I was, you know, grabbing them out of the, the mailbox before they could get them and started to try to figure out myself, you know, what are the media, you know, who are the publications, what are the issues in this industry. I then started to talk to existing customers. Um, I really got an, um, an earful at that point because it was really funny that um, a lot of the customers that I was speaking to um, had different perceptions of the company than the management team had. Um, and um, I just really started to pile up research, uh, talking to customers, talking to all different employees. I found some of the best ideas we had by just talking to employees and, you know, at the water cooler, um, you know, people that, um, you know, not, had no background in marketing or, you know, were just in either customer service or even development, you know, just saying, you know, this is something that I've observed and I, I would look into it, research it. Um, but for me, it was all about collecting all the information, um, you know, from existing customers, from our field sales teams, from our employees, and then just reading as much as I could to try to figure out the comp competition. Um, I also picked four key competitors and I studied their websites, I studied their social media, I set up tracking to find, you know, every single piece of news that comes out, you know, on them, I read about them, I tried to kind of figure out, you know, where their mindset was, and that's when I came up with the, the thought leadership, because I was like, nobody's actually putting out of any valuable content in our industry at that point. And I was like, we have a real opportunity here, and from one of the developers talking to me about the data of a recent attack, that we fought at the water cooler one day was, you know, the light bulb that went off and it's like, wait a second, we've got all this fantastic data. We can package this thought leadership and, you know, be differentiated within our space. Um, we have another question. Um, at what point did you decide you needed inside sales and how did you make the transition from field sales to inside sales? Oh, great question. Um, we, um, at first, brought on the call center. Um, we uh, brought on the call center first because it was much more economical, and you can bring on the call center to get billed by call, by volume, or by day, you know, to really scale with you. Um, and because of the success of the call center was the volume of leads that we got, you know, we started off with no inbound leads, to the first six months we generated over 900 um, and then we had um, over 5,000 over the next 12 months. So the volume of leads that came in to the point where we couldn't even respond to them effectively, you know, through just marketing automation that we needed and our sales teams were so overwhelmed with the volume of leads coming in that it was overshadowing, you know, their ability to contract negotiate and close the real qualified opportunities and we were missing opportunities because everybody was just so busy. So we built the inside sales team. Um, it's just started, it was almost um, uh, 12 months after we started, you know, after I was hired that we actually started the inside sales team. If I could do it all over again, I would have brought them in much earlier. Uh, but uh, we brought them in 12 months after we started the program. Um, and um, we've grown that team from one person to three people that it is today, and they handle literally, um, you know, 90 to 300 new leads a week um, that come through them, as well as nurture and incubate literally thousands of leads that uh, we have in the database from all these campaigns now, you know, 16 months strong. Okay, great. We are just um, out of time. Um, here's uh, on the last slide some contact details for me. You can feel free to call me um, and ask any additional questions. We'll be sending out with Kenneth a um, follow-up to this email, uh, this uh, webinar with an email blast with a link to download the presentation. Uh, we wish you success uh, in your marketing programs and thanks for joining us.